Who here hasn't seen The Mandalorian? I'm not watching it, even though I'm sure I could be. And without subscribing to Disney Plus and paying per play, simply by downloading a BitTorrent file of each episode as it is released, such as from popular BitTorrent hosting website, The Pirate Bay, at whatever its present proxies. I am sure torrent files of the Mandalorian episodes already released do exist, but I do not care to search them out, because I do not care to watch the Mandalorian personally. See, all I need to see is Baby Yoda, the current title for that Christmas gift abomination, until the episode drops revealing its real name. And I back off quick. Like, I get it, man. I just do not want it. As in, I am a fully informed consumer, and as such I simply do not wish to purchase your product. At the moment of this writing, December 4th, 2019, all that exists of Rise of Skywalker, hereafter referred to as ROS, are the copious snippets being released as trailers leading up to the film's official theatrical debut later this month, December 20th. From these, I would piece together a general plot line along the lines of Rey, Forceborn, or simply Last Jedi, ultimately confronts Kylo Ren, Ben Solo, on the deck of an unthawing Star Destroyer containing the cryogenically frozen, but now resuscitated, corpse of Emperor Palpatine. Ray and Ben work together to defeat Palpatine on the physical plane, only to discover he can rise to the plane of Force Ghost, at which point the Force Ghosts CGI of all the Jedi appear, and the movie ends in Meteor Race. There may be a possible second ending, wherein, on the physical plane, Ray contemplates killing Ben, and seeing herself turn to the dark side in a vision. In either event, the ultimate outcome remains uncertain, despite all subsequent obvious hints in the previews. The point isn't how the film actually ends or not. The point is that I, as a lifelong diehard, died-in-the-wool fan of the Star Wars franchise, do not even care how it ends. I do not care anymore. Disney's choices to genocide the entire EU extended universe and to scrap Lucas's own plot lines as planned for the sequels are, in my artistic opinion, unforgivable. Will I check out The Mandalorian someday? Yeah, maybe, if it falls into my lap or comes multiply highly recommended. But am I excited about it? Hell to the no. I could be, and one would assume demographically I should be. I was a huge enough fan of the OT, original trilogy, that I forgave the slow pacing of the PT, prequel trilogy, and conceded it was GL's, George Lucas, franchise, not my own to imagine however I wished. In the lead-up to the release of ROTS, Revenge of the Sith, I even began a Star Wars fan website that later evolved into BenPatia.com, my oldest and longest operational website. When ROTS was released, I was satisfied with the story arc as given to us by Lucas and enjoying the ongoing Clone Wars cartoon. I, like everyone else in that boat then, was waiting with bated breath and hoping for a lot more when we heard GL sold the franchise to Disney. I remember reading an article about the purchase in Wired magazine called The Droid Stays in the Picture, and right away I knew we were all in big, big trouble as Star Wars fans. For fans, that moment was our casual, oh, by the way, the Death Star just blew up Alderaan moment when we felt as crushed as patriotic Americans did on 9-11. Don't get me wrong, either. 
I liked Dave Filoni's work on the Clone Wars animated series very much, and I respect Lucas' choice to sell out his multi-billion dollar franchise for Peanuts money so he could go direct what he calls tone poems that I will never see. His toys, his choice. But what Disney has done with these characters and plot lines is, in my opinion, disgraceful and the epitome of corporate largesse in the realm of modern science fiction media. This was a historic moment for Disney to prove it could get behind the creativity of the franchise's existing fan base, and they failed. This was the moment for Disney to step back, glut fund some off-the-grid, up-and-coming FX studio, and do basically what Netflix tried to do with The Dark Crystal. Again, Disney failed. This was a big moment for Disney, wherein all they needed to do was shut up, back off, and pay the right people to deliver a respectful product. What did Disney do? Disney, Robert Iger, went full corporate ham, flexed its content-controlling little nuts, Kathleen Kennedy, and hired J.J. Abrams to take the blame for their massive debacle of a project. Some people, Tim Poole, claim it was TLJ, The Last Jedi, director Ryan Johnson's fault entirely that the franchise has taken such a gross downturn under Disney's ownership, but I disagree. I think the script was bad for TFA, the Force Awakens, from before J.J. Abrams was even signed on to direct. The whole premise is nothing but a shot-for-shot -shot retelling of A.N.H., A New Hope, with a different crew of characters. The O.T.'s actors were thrown in simply as expensive, backhanded fan service. If you start thinking about characters that could have been cut out of the plot of the sequels, you wind up with nobody left in them at all. So, though I do respect Dave Filoni, Ryan Johnson, and hell, even John Favreau, I guess, I cannot, and I think I speak for many fans teetering on turning away entirely from the whole concept as well, I cannot accept what Disney has done to the series. If one needs any further proof of how damaged, stunted, and internally inconsistent the Disney Star Wars universe now is, just look at the cutscenes for the Jedi Fallen Order video game produced, ostensibly, by EA. Now, EA has taken some flack, in my opinion not enough though, for rolling out essentially a beta test level game as Star Wars Battlefront online at maximum pricing rates. This game looks beautiful, because the landscapes are meticulous and based on terrain scans of the actual environments they depict. However, the predominantly first-person shooter gameplay has been so nearly impossible to work out on a massive multiplayer online role-playing game scale platform that the result has been EA choosing to make their newest Star Wars video game exclusively single-player. The plotline of this game that is, Jedi Fallen Order, is, if you take the nearly three hours to watch the entire cutscenes from it, almost entirely pointless as the three main characters, all united at the end, unanimously agree to destroy the MacGuffin that had been driving the plot all along, thus rendering their whole adventure irrelevant. Again, this leaves anyone who bothers to devote their time to learning about these characters feeling betrayed to find out their whole adventure didn't even matter in the end, except to introduce the characters to each other. And, yet again, had the characters that weren't needed for the storyline been properly edited out of it, there would be no story left at all. Which brings us to Kylo Ren. Now, if Darth Vader is Felix the Cat, and Kylo Ren is Mickey Mouse. Darth Vader's villainy was meant only to foreshadow the heinous plotting of the even more evil Emperor Palpatine. 
However, as we all know by now, in ROTJ, Return of the Jedi, Vader ultimately upstaged Palpatine and tossed him down a coal reactor ventilation shaft. In the Chronicles of the OT, Vader was a bigger badass than Palpatine. End of story. So, who is Kylo Ren from an artistic character creation point of view? He was meant to be Han Solo and Leia Organa's son, although looks may be deceiving, since Adam Driver looks nothing at all like Harrison Ford or Carrie Fisher. He was supposed to be Luke Skywalker's best student, until one night Luke creepily caught him sleeping, and then Kylo decided to flip the script on one master, Luke, and go full bitch for a rival master, Snoke, instead. By the way, the ambition of Kylo Ren's character is limply demonstrated by his betraying and killing his second master, Snoke, in a very sudden plot twist, one of many in TLJ. So what have we learned about Kylo Ren? Well, he's opportunistic. He likes to be the boss, but he's basically just meant to be symbolic of a spoiled teen. To the same exact extent, Snoke represented Walt Disney himself. Kylo Ren is a nod and a doff of the hat to Mickey Mouse. And all this because of some unnamed executive producer's misguided hope that such subtle insinuations of corporate branding and product placement into the monomyth of modern history would appear deep to some blogger 20 years from now because they just realized Kylo Ren is somehow a symbol of Nietzsche's uber mention and Jung's shadow self combined but somehow missed the same being able to be said about the Hanna-Barbera cartoon character Underdog. Whether as Underdog, Kylo Ren, Mickey Mouse, or Mighty Mouse, Anakin Skywalker, or hell, even Snagglepuss, this kid's cartoon anti-hero archetype is probably the single worst marketing mistake I've ever seen in my life. Making space opera G-rated, watered-down, saccharine-saturated, and action-packed eye candy for the kids is as off-brand and off-color as whoever was supposed to be wrangling Nixon's sweat glands during the 1960 presidential debates against JFK was fresh off the ranch. Giving kids a toy, and let's face it, the pinnacle of all art really is the Navajo knockoffs of Hopi Kachina dolls, based on any of the characters in the sequels, is taking a toy away from a kid who grew up with the OT. But giving them a Mickey Mouse toy and telling them it's Kylo Ren, well, that is simply disgusting to me. Disney's Star Wars is dead to me, barring anything short of a miracle. As far as I am concerned, it's all one massive historical mistake that will eventually be recognized as one of the greatest corporate media black ops style cover-ups of all time. That solo movie makes me nauseous just thinking about it. Watching some idiot prance around for two hours grinning like a giddy virgin and never once even trying to look like a younger Harrison Ford, does not space opera make. What I enjoy most about the OT of Star Wars was its space opera. The scene on the second Death Star over Endor, with Luke and Vader and Palpatine, is worth tolerating the comical antics of the Ewoks to me. Two things I learned about Star Wars from the prequels. One, GL was racist as hell. Not only were the Ewoks a racist depiction of tribal culture in general, consider the Jawas and Tusken Raiders of the desert planet Tatooine, or the toad-like Neomoidians invading the swamp homelands of that stooge Jar Jar Binks. Two, plot pacing and coincident timing. Even though TPM and AOTC are slow-paced, they are building to the crescendo of ROTS, in which all the pieces fall into place all at once in a brilliant plot twist. 
two things I learned from watching Disney's Star Wars sequels. One, J.J. Abrams never owned any Star Wars action figures as a kid. Two, Ryan Johnson's biggest continuity error and plot hole in making TLJ was not closing his loop when he went to sign the contract. But hell, I've said my piece for now. Time for me to exit stage right. Greasy forearms. Out. Firstly, I want to apologize in advance for everything I'm about to say. It's not my preferred nature to be vindictive and petty, scathing and cruel, and verbally abusive in general. That being said, I have seen the movie billed as the end of the Skywalker saga, directed by J.J. Abrams and produced by Disney. But before I even begin to try to unpack the variegated manifold of my disappointments in ROS, let me back it up to the blue carpet gala event, the night of the premiere in Hollywood, which I watched live streaming on YouTube. It was a corporate extravaganza of mediocre proportions, demonstrating masterful craftspeople's skills in assembling near life-size scale replicas of three X-wing fighters in a spangled canopied tent being totally ignored by a seemingly unending flow of new celebrities who are now in some vague way or other associated with the franchise, apparently. It was truly a walk of fame and a star-studded evening. Mark Hamill could be spotted in the corner conversing with Clerks writer-director star Kevin Smith and his two wives, Jennifer Schwalbach Smith and Jason Mewes, J to Smith's mime character, Silent Bob, while John Favreau was handing out medallions from The Mandalorian and J.J. Abrams was sneaking around behind Dominic Monaghan making sure he didn't drunkenly spoil the plot to the terrified, teleprompted interviewers on the live stream. Even Ian McDermott was there to answer his most FAQ. What is the line fans most often ask him to repeat? The answer, by the way, is, Do it! Which is also, of historical note, the slogan of Nike, the mega-monopoly athletic shoe and clothing company. Oh, it was truly a sight to behold. Even Spielberg arrived as, presumably, the plus one of Harrison Ford, whom was grinning his wry, cockeyed smile in support. In fact, the only ones who weren't represented at all were the celebrities who made the P.T., aside from in the form of the Clone Wars cartoon show's voice actors cast. Oh, and GL. He wasn't there either. He wasn't anywhere near, even via remote teleconference, the first public screening of the final installment in his originally plotted as nine-part monomythic story arc. So this god among men who created a modern myth was benched in the final inning of his own damn game. Now that's some true Hollywood inside baseball. In rumors circulating among fan channels on YouTube, G.L. was consulted at the last minute and some scenes were reshot based on his story notes, but ultimately these were left on the cutting room floor. G.L. was, finally, edited entirely out of his own opera's finale by Disney to pander to a younger demographic in an opportunistic attempt to make a little more money. Again, my sadness in regard to this sequel trilogy's ultimate outcome is as nuanced and multifaceted as The Rise of Skywalker is the world's most expensive sketch. And so, on with the show. I went into viewing ROS, which I did indeed download on BitTorrent, with great trepidation. For one thing, sometimes cam rips nowadays have ads and Korean subtitles hard-edited into the MP4 file 
and those really interrupt the pacing. Luckily, the copy I got was sufficiently legit, although a GL cut it was not. Ultimately, I felt prepared to be let down, but still hopeful it could surprise me and end up being better than I could have expected. I wanted a good ending to the epic saga, and I was prepared to concede it and accept such if such was offered. I lowered my expectations and started the video. By the end, I was underwhelmed. With Steamboat Willie at the helm, Star Wars has become a titanic gag reel of plot holes, non sequiturs, poorly scripted quips, hugs, and bad sci-fi tech that instantly crashes into the ice-cold reception of its former fans and then slowly sinks for the next two hours. Including the resurrection of Palpatine in the first reel, with so little exposition, was simply fronting good meat over top of bad to conceal the rot beneath. The choice to reveal the main villain at the very beginning of the first act makes the character look weak. That is a simple law of plot development and character structuring inherent to storytelling in any genre. The result of doing so means the epilogue has to be balanced with needless false endings thrown in to decompress afterwards from the requisitely overdramatic pinnacle that is the forced third act. In other words, despite all the twists and turns, the show ain't over till the fat lady sings. And oh, how Daisy Ridley sings as the granddaughter of Emperor Palpatine, whom apparently had a side piece and a son the whole time he was moonlighting as Sith Emperor as well, that until this movie no one had ever mentioned or heard about. And so, just as with everything from Kylo Ren's plasma blade laser sword to where Han Solo buys his vests, it's better to just smile stupidly, suspend your disbelief, and go along for the tragic ride than it is to stick your neck out and ask any questions. Like, for example, how do you destroy a whole fleet of Star Destroyer-class supercarriers with a single troop transport frigate just by jumping to hyperspace nearby? Or, for example, what is Snoke's origin? Or... How did Kylo Ren get Darth Vader's mask? Or, who decided to make Laura Dern's hair look like cotton candy? But, alas, if I were to ask every single question Disney's sequels pose but never answer, I would merely be wasting precious moments of my own lifetime that would be better spent doing literally anything else. Disney's idea of Star Wars is to make it big and make it fast and then think people will go along with it even though it makes no sense in any way whatsoever. The plot holes in the sequels are big enough to hyper-jump the Death Star through. Any reasonably logical eight-year-old could tell you that. Watching the Mouseketeer edition of GL's Vision is like seeing the OT over again identically, only through the eyes of the world's dumbest child. As GL told Charlie Rose in 2015 on CBS 60 Minutes, he sold Star Wars to white slavers. These white-collar crooks who dealt GL out of this last hand of Sabbath deserve to be tossed in a sarlacc pit and forgotten about for eternity, but instead they are rolling in the loot of their booty after plundering a genius's IP. And, after all, what fan service? Abusing the OT characters and ignoring the PT except in an audio overdub is not transporting anybody to a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away.